So we're going to look about the arthritis in the, in young athletes. First, the um, if we look at the etiology. These patients are, are, are presenting arthritis, and um, we have to do a lot of post-traumatic arthritis. And one of the uh, highest uh, etiology is remain is instability. Either it's a patient who had never had surgery, is not unstable anymore, is just painful. Or he had surgery with a, a bone block which is prominent. Or it can be inflammatory arthritis, arthritis of instability, as I told you before, crystalline arthritis, which is quite rare in the young adults, or avascular necrosis. Um, most of the time, this patient, they, it, is not, it is not just a bony problem, it's a, they have a soft tissue involvement with the uh, rotator cuff that is not always normal, and with some soft tissue contractures and they have stiffness with the uh, capsular contractures. And most of the time, these patients have lost their extra rotation. And this arthritis is associated with osseous deformities, like uh, some regional osteopenia, and the glenoid wear. It can be concentric or eccentric, and particularly the posterior wear, which is the most difficult part to treat. Uh, um, I think it's because these patients, they still have a very good anterior cuff, a good subscapularis muscle, but the posterior cuff is weak, and the, the humeral head is, uh, is uh, controlled by asymmetrical forces, and uh, they have a strong cuff in the front and a poor cuff in the back. And they have also, uh, they evaluate with the humeral collapse, and the head is flattened and is not round anymore. Still, this uh, incidence is quite low compared to the hip, the knee, and it's more women than men. Uh, the diagnostic is made with x-rays, so still for, with arthritis, the best exam remains plain x-rays. It's very dangerous to make the diagnostic of arthritis with MRI. The, main, the best exam is the x-rays with the AP view in external rotation, down rotation, and neutral rotation, with the um, uh, outlet view and the axillary view. You need all these images when you have uh, arthritis of the shoulder. And uh, in Paris, I can tell you in my hospital, it's easier to have a good MRI than good plain X-rays. If you have any doubt, there's an X-ray which is not well known, which is the weighted 40 degrees uh, degree AP view. Uh, you just put uh, five pounds in the, in the arm of the patients at 90 degrees of abduction, and you make an X-rays. And you can see some early joint space narrowing that you don't see on the plain X-rays, classical one. It can be the, uh, the shoes view for the shoulder. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the lesions you have on, on the cartilage, you have uh, usually a lot of uh, osteophytes on the humerus and on the uh, glenoid. Most of the time, the, uh, the cartilage on the anterior part of the glenoid is quite spared. The, the way is posterior. The uh, glenoid can be biconcave, normal here and then where here, so it's a biconcave aspect. It's a fixed posterior subluxation of the head, and you have the, uh, this uh, false enlargement of the glenoid, because this is just a stereophyte. And you can have the some loose bodies related to the uh, secondary chondromatosis. So you, you will have to deal with all this in the young patients. Uh, the position, the AP position of the humeral head is crucial. You have to know if your head is centered, yes or no. Because if your head is posterior subluxed, like in this position, like in this case, <coughs> I think whatever you do, the head will be posterior, always posterior subluxed. There's no way you can put this head back centered. So you have to accept this. It is, uh, I think it's a muscle imbalance, and whatever you do, it will come back in the same position. This is why the problem is that we are, we are working with some uh, prosthetic implants that are symmetrical, and we put this in patients with asymmetrical forces. Uh, the aspect of the glenoid is crucial. If you're an A1 or A2, this kind are not very difficult to deal with, but if you have a B1, and especially a B2, then you're in trouble, and you can have a B2 in the young patients. I've seen some B2, some B2 in patients younger than 50 years old. And B2 is a very difficult patient to deal with. C is a patient without any glenoid. Uh, I must admit that now, I've, 
uh, with the M you have the, the, the plain X-rays. The MRI gives you the same information as the uh, as the CT, and you have uh, don't have to make any injections with the arthroscopy. It is uh, less accurate on body lesions, but you can still see the shape of the of the of the glenoid, and you get information for the soft tissues. So now my preoperative planning is plain X-rays and MRI. If you look at the classification for the central arthritis, when the head is central, when the uh, acromiumeral distance is maintained, you know that the cuff, although the cuff may have a small rupture, the cuff is functional, the head is centered. The classification of a semicellar and Prieto is just looking at the size of the osteophyte. In this classification, they don't care about the joint space. So this patient with this very small osteophyte there would be a grade two, although he has a full and uh, joint space narrowing. So this is why Gilles Valch has modified this classification and I had the four, stage four with joint space narrowing, which is something I think we should care of. This patient are complaining of pain. Uh, in our series, the average was around seven with stiffness and most of the time they don't go ab ab mainly above 90 degrees of elevations, loss of external rotations. And this will of course affect the effect activity of daily living, the work and the sport. You have to look at the humeral head, look at the size of the osteophytes for many reasons, because this will limit osteo rotations, but also if you have huge osteophytes, huge osteophytes, it will prevent sometimes the head from upward migration. And you can have patients with a central head, huge osteophyte, and in fact the cuff is torn. So this is what we say, if the head is central, the cuff is functional. This is true, unless you have a huge osteophyte that comes out, sometimes can block the head. You have to look for local flattening of the head. This will change indications. Your patient might have some body lesions related to the previous injuries, like uh, heel sex lesions, and a bone loss on the anterior rim and the posterior wear here. You see this patient, no more cartilage is here posteriorly. So the joint space narrowing is viable, very viable. Some patients have uh, no joint space narrowing and they are very painful. Some patients have this kind of constructive joint space narrowing. You should look for the loose bodies and look for the previous surgeries because when you have to deal with these patients, sometimes they already have a screw there, they have some anchors, and this will, uh, you have to take it in charge to take care of these patients. If we, think about, if we talk about joint replacement, prosthetic, you can use a hemi, you can use a total, you can use an atomical replacement, you can use a reverse replacement. Uh, for the humeral side, you can use a partial implant focal implant, you can use a cup, you can use a stem implant, or you can use this new generation of a stem-free implant. They are the same fixation without any stem. Uh, for the glenoid side, there have been uh, some proposal not to put any kind of implant using meniscal allograft. You take the uh, meniscal allograft and you replace the uh, you make an arthroplasty without any prosthesis, or you can use a flap of uh, fasciolata, iliotibial band, or you can use a glenoid implant which will be cemented, non-cemented, metal back, or full poly. So you have many choices. You have, you have to deal, as I told you before, with bone deficiency. If you have a big heel sacs lesions, you might have problems to fix this kind of implant. If you have a big heel sacs lesions, you might have to deal with this bone loss, and you will probably need to use a stem implant. If you have a big lesions, like in these ladies with the big lesions of the uh, of uh, the big bone loss on the outer part of the glenoid, you have to make a bone graft before you, you even think about putting an implant inside. Um, this patient will need for sure uh, a capsular release. They will need a capsular release because they, have, they are fixed in, in, in external rotation for a long time. Um, this uh, will uh, this is related to the uh, joint space narrowing and the Postal displacement of the head and rejection of the osteomorphite. These patients are stiff in external rotation. So you have to work on this, doing capsular release, rejection of osteophytes, and uh, so release also of the subscap. And when you start with this patient who's been limited in, uh, in uh, external rotation, uh, when you do the surgery, when you detach the subscap, be aware that if you're not able to, to close the subscap at the end, in external rotation, you're going to be in great trouble, or your patient's going to be in great trouble after. So we've tried to do this technique of putting a meniscal allograft because we know that the 
all these implants on the glenoid side have a weight of looseness, important weight of looseness. So, so you have uh, tried this technique of using the many graph that you convert to a something circle and you will put inside the, the joint to make a biologic resurfacing of the, of the glenoid. And we, all our patients failed, all of them, all of them. We've tried some other techniques, conservative techniques. We thought these patients with this posterior aspect of the glenoid, with a posterior wear of the glenoid, we thought that like in the knee, if we make a glenoid osteotomy, if we convert this, this will push the head in the front and we make some uh, release of the posterior part of the glenoid. This was our worst result. This is one of our case, worst results. So it's not because you are acting on the bone, on the glenoid, that the head is going to go uh, anteriorly, because still the muscle, the imbalance of the muscle is the most important part. So glenoid resurfacing with allograft, we all have revised our patients with implants, and all our studies were failures. What were our, our, our results with uh, the non-prosthetic arthroplasty of the glenoid? They were doing better at one year. It was only subjectives, but then everything started to decrease. We had, so our patients were still painful, 2.3. <coughs> Flexion was 136, and acceleration was 55 degrees. But this was one year, and then they all decreased, all of them. What are our last indications? Patients with really focal defect. This could be indication for a local uh, for replacement if they have normal cartilage <coughs> and normal cartilage on the other in the other side. This might be indication for this kind of focal implants, but this is a quite a rare indication. And now there are some techniques that you can do this under arthroscopy. For the glenoid surfacing, we, we don't do any more lateral meniscal allograft. Uh, we, are, we have stopped these, these indications. We have abandoned totally to do this. We do uh, now, if we have to do something, we put an implant on the glenoid side. If we compare now, do we have to do a hemi on these young patients or a total? That's a big question. Hemi or total? For sure, the total shoulder arthroplasty, this is the hemi, this is the total. This is the value on pain, mobility, activity, strength, and constant. The total is always doing better than the hemi, always. In value and in gain, it's always doing better. So if you think that you have to do the best for your patients, you have to put total. So um, the problem is that uh, total are doing better than the hemi, but uh, you will have to revise them. These patients are, are, are young, you know that you will have to revise this prosthesis. But I prefer to revise the total than to revise the hemi with this kind of erosion. In my hand, this is the worst case. These kind of patients are inc incredibly hard to revise. It's even worse than total shoulder arthroplasty. In this kind of patients, the only solution is to put a reverse prosthesis. So it's a problem of, of, of a contract with you and your patient. Information, I tell my patient, I can give you 12 good years. When do you want them, now or later? Because the problem is that the second arthroplasty it's not like in the hip. The second hip is quite as good as the first one. For the shoulder, it's not true. The second one is not as good as the first one. So the problem is that what you want when you have to want to have these 12 good years, now or later? To be honest, they always say now. I want, I want them now. But the problem is that the total shoulder arthroplasty gives the patients a forgotten shoulder. They are normal, normal life. And one of my patients was a judo player. He had multiple dislocation surgeries, arthritis. He was 37 and did the shoulder replacement. He was so happy, he went back to doing judo with shoulder arthroplasty. So you can put a prosthesis in the patients, but you cannot put a brain. <laughs> but if you decide to do a shoulder replacement, you have to preserve the bone stock. That's very important because I think you will have to revise this patient. So I think you have to move to this kind of implant that will be easy, revisable. When you revise this, you will be able to put a stem implant. The, you, your canal is, is still uh, without, not violated. And if you put an implant, I think that the peg implant have less bone loss than the killed implant. You have to respect the curve tendons and particularly subscap. If you have a failure of the subscap, for sure you have to put a reverse through the arthroplasty. So for the humeral implant, I think it's better to use either a cup or a stem-free implant. 
it's easy revisable instead of easy convertible. Because the biggest problem is overstuffing. And this is the biggest problem with, with CUP. The CUP, you see, that this is the X-rays of Copeland in his paper, and he thinks that this is good. It's an example. Look at the position of the head compared to the chromium. It's a huge overstuffing of the CUP, and this patient will have a glial erosion for sure. I mean, I think this is converting a hemi to a total is a nightmare. If you think about the glial implant, if you hesitate, put one. If you hesitate during surgery, look at the cartilage, it's not nice, and you hesitate to put a glial implant, I think it's better to put a glial implant than you have to deal with the glial erosion later on. But this is, of course, the weakest part of the, of the prosthesis, and this will be the reason for revision. Uh, you have to preserve the bone stock, have a good fixation, and I think that the, the cement peg curved back is the best option. The mismatch, I think we, have to, we need a mismatch, and I have to try to have a, uh, implant less concave as possible, but you know that you will 100% reduce the lines at 10 years. All our patients will have some lines at 10 years, that's for sure. So uh, the ideal component, cemented component will be pegged, curved back, rough surface, not a lot of cement, just one meter of cement, and to have a good cementing technique with pressurization. For the moment, it's the best we can do. What about the reverse? Are we, do we have to put a reverse on, a, on, on the young patients? This might happen, as is for B2. For B2 prosthesis, the only solution is to put a reverse. If you put the anatomical on B2, it's going to be a failure for sure. And if you look at the results of the reverse, the uh, Severship analysis of reverse is comparable to total shoulder arthroplasty. It's not, it's not less good than the total shoulder arthroplasty. The reverse is not a salvage procedure. Prosthesis. It's a prosthesis like another. So it's a very rare indication, but the age is not a contraindication. In this case, the best indication is to put a reverse. So you have to put a reverse in your own patient. So my first thing would be prevention. And prevention is prevention of arthritis and do the surgery at the first time of dislocation. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but think about it. You, you do this for the ACL. We do all our ACL repair. We, we don't wait until the patients are developing uh, knee instability. <coughs> Torn ACL, three months later, surgery. They, don't have, they never develop any instability of the knee. And this why? To preserve the meniscus, to preserve the arthritis. And for the shoulder replacement, you will have excellent results. But the problem is revision. And we, when you surgery, patient of between 35 or 55, you know that 12 years later, you will have to redo surgery with the less good results. So we still have some work to do on new implants. Thank you.